Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Bim House Radio, live from the Bim House in Amsterdam. Tonight we'll present to you the second night of Duke Festival. This is our music, the theme of Duke Festival 2018, named after the Ornett Coleman album. Signals the return of the Amsterdam Improv Collective Duke to its roots, personal projects by its individual core members. We start the night with Erik Boeren Quartet, Erik Boeren on the cornet, Michael Moore, alto saxophone and clarinet, Wilbert Theo the double bass and Han Bennick on the drums. Followed by Ab Baars Trio, Ab Baars tenor saxophone, Wilbert Theo the bass and Martin van Duinhoven on the drums. And we'll end the night with the Coimbra Residency. John Dijkman, tenor saxophone, Luis Vicente, trumpet, Alexander Hawkins on the piano, Hugo Entunes on the double bass, and Mark Sanders on the drums. Have fun with the second Duke night. Eric Buren, Han Benning, Michael Moore, and uh, Wilbert Theodor.
Han, Wilbert, Erik, Michael, Benik, de Joden, Boerenmoor. Dat was het Erik Boeren kwartet. Doe ze pol. We will have a short break. En dan uh, zijn we terug met het ontluisterende Abbaars trio. Ja, ja, ja. ja. Abbaas, welkom in de studio in Bimhuis Radio. What is it today? Saturday, 16 June 2018. I'd like to start with um, a quote from the book of Larry Cart, published in 2004 in Jazz in Search of Itself. In the introduction, he um, talks about uh, how jazz uh, developed and how it should develop, which is um, a getting together of jazz critics, audiences and musicians who want to develop a thing. Um, and in it, he says th this. Um, I have to look up oh yeah, here. On Ab Bar's songs, which is a record of Ab, which he had Ab? Oh, early 2000s. Early 2000s. The saxophonist clarinetist responds to a series of Native American melodies with intense inventiveness and no hint of guilt or travelogue sentiment. The breadth of the cultural gap Bars chose to jump must have been a large part of what enabled him to do it. And yet the liveliness of the Dutch jazz is so firmly linked to its quirkiness that the results can seem a bit wistful, even elegiac. A case of fun and games before the fall. Um, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions on how did you, apparently to American journalists, you are at the forefront of helping developing jazz. And you're not the only one, I think, mm -hmm. in, in Amsterdam there's quite a few uh, musicians who, who, who keep playing sort of like playful music and keep developing it. And we are here at the Duke Festival, which tries to celebrate that and tries to present a state of the art of what's happening these days. And you're definitely part of that. How did you get uh, to keep being an inventive player and what what influenced you to start with well these are difficult questions <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> but um i think a lot of it started off when i was a child my mother stimulating me to take piano lessons and uh, just as a general idea that it would be nice to be able to play some music at parties or in 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 small settings uh, for the family or something and <clears throat> then when i was about 13 or 14 i started listening to some great bands like earth wind and fire and colosseum and there was one specific band from the town where I grew up and it was called the Mr. Albert Show that had uh, a saxophone player in it named Bettis Borgers and he ah. was my first hero. Ah, yes, yes, yes. And um, <clears throat> so that was 
live music that I could go to and listen and hear and I could speak to him afterwards. And beside that, I started collecting uh, jazz records. And What was your first record that you, that you bought? Do my you first remember? jazz record? Yes. That was John Coltrane, Life at Seattle, a double a double record. Did, did somebody recommend it or did you just... Well, um, I was still uh, studying at school and on the Belgium radio on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays from five to six, there was a radio program, one hour, all about the music of John Coltrane. So uh -huh. from the very first recordings of John Coltrane until the last recordings. So... When school was out, I cycled, had to cycle for about half an hour. I cycled as fast as I could to home. And I had the radio next to my bed. So I would lay down on the bed, put on the radio and listen to Coltrane. And uh, that stimulated me to to buy a record. And I remember coming in, in, the, in the record shop. This was a tiny little record shop and the owner... Uh, he was a musician himself, and for that reason, he had music in the shop that he loved himself. Besides the the more commercial kind of uh, things, and he was looking at me and said, "Are you sure you want to buy this?" I said, "Yeah, I heard it on the radio, and uh, but it's very difficult music, and uh, yeah, but still, I want to have it." Right. And uh, so I went home, and from then on. <coughs> but can you can you? Uh, remember what, what attracted you in, 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 in listening to Coltrane's music? Oh, what was, I think... Did, did you... It, was it just like, oh, I like it? And when no, I was no, young, no. I bought records because I liked the record sleeves. That was, that it was, was a whole new world that, that opened up for me. Uh, a world that I didn't know of. And I thought, wow, if this is possible... That's wonderful. I, I want to to be there and join that and do it myself. And uh, yes, um, so uh, it had an incredible energy. And uh, well, I think I also felt something spiritual or the depth of the music, and right, that it yeah. was not just doing something, but that in this case Coltrane had gone a long, long way and that it was uh, based on a deep tradition and great knowledge of, of any kind of music, I guess. And I, I, I didn't know, I couldn't put the words what I was listening to, no, but no, no. it was <clears throat> amazing and it gave me the idea, if this is possible, why not, why not go there and... and, and play and do it myself and uh, it was very stimulating I, I never got afraid from musicians that I really liked uh, I recently heard uh, a, a few musicians talking about Sonny Rollins and they all said there were three or four musicians they all said when I first heard Sonny Rollins live or on s record or CD I couldn't play for a week And I, right. I never had that feeling. No, I thought, no, no, no. wow, if that's possible, I, I want to do that too. And But I'll, I'll find my own way to play this music. But with that energy, yeah. and with that uh, curiosity. and, and uh, So it, I always felt it very stimulating. And uh, uh, yeah, I got a lot of energy from it. But what you're saying, like, I'd like to do it my own way. Is that, is that, is that, I remember... The first time I heard you play, I must have been 17 myself. I was in, you were playing with a Theo Luvendi mm -hmm. consort. Um, Hans Tilfer was in the band. Uh, Theo Luvendi, of course. Uh, um, Alla Troost on guitar, Martin van Dijnhoven. Yeah. It was a, about Guus Jansen, I heard mm -hmm. then for the first time. I, I always remember a solo that you were playing. Mm -hmm. um, I was just starting out to learn the cornet to play to play the cornet myself and i heard you play solo I, i'll never forget i must mm. i've never told you this but i must admit that it, you took a little 
element and you sort of like transposed it or developed it. I mean, I was trying to to work out what it, it was not playing over the chords changes or something like that. You mm. took it away from the tune and then did your own thing. And I was very, very impressed. Mm. And I remember literally thinking like, ah, this is a way you can do things. Yeah, as yeah, a, I mean, yeah. I, I, I took it in a sort of like general yeah. stride. But wh where did that come from? I mean, this was, you were, you must have been 18 yourself or something like that. Yeah. Um, <coughs> it was very early Well, on. what I remember from that period was that I listened to a lot of music and there were musicians that I was really attracted to. And I, for example, well, this Bertus Borges, the saxophone player, yeah. I could imitate him very well. And then <laughs> after a while, I got bored. I thought, yeah, I can do that, but that's not what I want. Yeah. Same thing with Steve Lacey. At the time, I played soprano saxophone. And up to a certain degree, I could play what he played and, and have his sound. And then uh, at a certain t uh, time, Sean Burgeon came up to me at the old bar in the BIM I said, hey, Steve, how are you doing? <laughs> and I thought, okay, now it's time to... To, to switch the clay net. To I, do I, something. I, I yeah. do remember your, your f like on Postpartje Klein, Konijn and Hall, number one or two, I forgot, but the, the brilliant soprano solo on Mr. Yo, so that's mm. fantastic. Uh, but this also kind of like explains, you changed from BIM system clarinet to Albert system clarinet fairly recently is that for the same reason is it sound wise it's is for the sound i i, I uh, really is it love to build in another handicap or do you enjoy that is is, is that what's going on um, well it was uh both um, but mainly i was looking for the sound of the great new orleans clarinet players that I started listening to, or was listening to, and I had the feeling I never could, could, could get that sound on a, on a Boehm system clarinet. Yeah. So, uh, by coincidence, I could buy one, yeah. and uh, I, I immediately fell in love with it. Right. And. Um, um, uh, but can you can you like sound wise? Can you on a on an Albert system clarinet? Can you do different things than on a well, Boehm system has, clarinet? Well, it has or? a depth and uh, an earthiness in it, a woody sound. And uh, uh, well, if you read uh, the literature and read interviews with all the players, there are some that say, "Well, I can play both, and I mm. will sound the same on a Boehm system or on the Albert system." And others really say, no, man, it's the it's the Albert system. That's the tr tradition of New Orleans. That's and the one, uh, yeah. uh, That's what I want to play. And yeah. I can hear it when, when somebody plays the Boehm system. Oh. So there's a lot of opinions about it. But I'm I'm very happy with what I have now and uh, cool. Cool. Where, it, where it brings me. Fantastic. Mm. Thank you, Up, for this conversation i think that's you, it you don't want to know about i, I the, know i want to know i want to know <laughs> lots about the trio but i think we in the okay. in this framework we should call this an end Good. thank you very much yeah, thank you eric Carolyn Muns, uh, coordinator of Stichting Doek, uh, organizer of the Doek Festival. Um, I, we are almost at the end of the festival. And there's quite a few things I, I hope that you have to say about, about the festival. The, the festival presents the state of improvised music in Amsterdam. This year we chose for the title this is our music and we unlike other years we invited bands of the core members of Duke to to perform um, how different is that from having to uh, uh, jung uh, juggle uh, uh, 
all sorts of musicians coming from abroad with, with hotels and, and, and <laughs> how much more easy is this festival for you, Carolyn? Well, it is, yeah, it is a lot easier and it's a little bit going back to how it was in the early days when we used to have, you know, usually two days in the BIM house and each, each member of Dook would think, have a project that they'd present. Um, in that way, it's similar, but we added a workshop this year, so I, did add, I decide yeah. to make it e easy for myself, not by saying, hey, why don't we do workshops as well? But um, so that's, that's been an added thing uh, to do, but a really valuable thing, I think. I'm really pleased that we chose to do that. The, the, the workshop was in the beam house, in the, in the rehearsal rooms for, for two days and three days even. And the, all the eight core members of Duke were teaching in two hour sessions. Um, and tomorrow night, I think Sunday night, the 17th in the round, there's going to be a presentation on that. But how did the workshop go? Did, did you get any comments from, from, from the people who attended the workshop? Did yep. they, did the, they the progress? Did they, the, 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 were they happy, <laughs> etc.? Yeah, I spoke to them mainly on the second day and people, yeah, they were reeling a little bit. I think they had, had, had so much information. Uh, that there was a lot to take in and a lot to process. So I think sometimes with workshops, what I've noticed also with the Dutch Impro Academy is that people go away and then a lot of the things start to make sense. But I think it's great having the workshops during the festival because all the workshop participants have the chance to go to the festival concerts. Yes. And then they can see a lot of the things that people have been talking about. They can actually see them happening on the stage. Perhaps or perhaps not, but yeah. there's a, yeah, I think there's a chance for sort of reinforcing the things that they've been working on or talking about. So I think that's a really, it, I like the combination. You like the combination, yeah. 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 yeah, it was intense. I, 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 can, <laughs> I can tell you. You, you are working for Stichting Duke since 2000. And one. And one. <laughs> you are from Australia. Mm -hmm. You studied... Musicology, Eth ethnic ethnomusicology. Mu ethnomusicology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did you get to have that? Can you give us an example of, of uh, can you say there was a moment that you s start to appreciate the, the music that uh, the improvisers in Amsterdam make more than, or did you understand from the beginning onwards? Or what was your motivation to, to, because you're, on board for 17 years, if, <laughs> or, or if, that, if not 18 years. Yeah. And you've done a, a terrific job. Well, thank like you. coordinating thank you. This, this bunch of, you know, they're all individualists. Mm. And somehow they're bonded together. You mm. keep an eye on that. But what. what, what, uh, what was there a decisive moment that you think, like, oh. Um, I, I have to admit, when I first started with Duke, I knew nothing about improvised music at all. I remember Dick Lucas at the job interview saying, so what do you understand about, what do you think improvised music is? And I admitted freely that I really didn't know. And, uh -huh. I, and I sort of gave some ideas what I thought happened during imp improvising. But I've always loved music and I ended up studying ethnic. I've, I've had no career path in my life whatsoever and I've always mm -hmm. floated, done all sorts of things. But in my 30s, I looked around and thought, What's been the, 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 what do you call it? The roll de drad, the, yeah, the common thread in my yeah. life, and that was music. And I right. thought, and, and I've always been interested in not just in music, the actual uh, nuts and bolts of the music, but also the social context. I always find really, really interesting too yes. why, why people play, what they play, where they play. And um, so I decided I really wanted to work in music. And, uh, was in Amsterdam and I saw that the job advertised and uh, it sounded interesting and, this, and I'd done a lot of those the sorts of things that I needed to do for the job I had experience in so I yeah. thought so I started I remember I started in October in December and then they said yeah so I started and then I was told that there was going to be a festival in December All right. <laughs> they had a venue so there was one thing organised that was the Felix Beard uh, yeah. one I see yes but I can remember going to that and being fairly 
bamboozled by what I heard. I really, a lot of it I couldn't make a lot of sense of. Because right. I think I was, even though I'd listened to a lot of contemporary composed music, so I had right. reasonably open ears, I think. Yeah. But still there were things that I, I just couldn't figure out what people were doing at all or why they were doing it. But gradually I just kept going to concerts and um, just... Yeah, having an open mind. That's what I, I, I was going to spirit. ask you. Yeah, is that the, 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 like uh, building up that this experience for se- in over a period of se- 17, 18 years, mm. and starting from scratch. zero, <laughs> from scratch? If people are interested in, in this kind of music, can you put it to words? Like what they should look out for. What is what is attractive in this in this music? Obviously, you started to to not to all that the Duke members are doing. You, I know that you're not attracted to everything they do, but some of it. There are. There, can you give us examples of are there some denominators to um, describe it? I uh, think I think that the the that that it happens in the moment that you're there. That's why I don't particularly like listening to it at home i like to be there i like to see you're not a record collector in that sense no not at all no and i i like that interaction i like that you just and i think that was my problem at first i was wanting to know what was going to happen next or have some sort of clue but that if when you leave when you let that loose then really exciting things happen and then you start following what everyone's doing and you're you are with the musicians you're part of you're actually I think as an audience member, you actually have a very, can have a very active role. You yes, are listening, absolutely. You are yeah. there in the moment with the musicians following what's happening. I can, and, I can tell you that from a musician's point of view, the audience is, is, is definitely almost a player uh, mm. uh, with, mm. within, within the situation. Yeah. And then when I interviewed up earlier this evening, I um, uh, read a few lines from an introduction of a book by Larry Carter, an American jazz journalist, who basically says that jazz or music with improvisation in it is uh, should keep developing and, and reporters like journalists, musicians and audience he's not saying that they all play equal parts, mm. but they are definitely all, all part of the same development mm. and that's and that's what maybe Duke is struggling with to 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 get an audience to help develop it or to what what yeah, are there any struggling I, I think I've I think in earlier on I used to feel oh why don't we get a full house in the BIM house why don't we have this you know I'd want to get bigger and better but I've come to realize that it is music that is difficult for a lot of people but though I'd notice if people f- come to it a lot of people who've never heard it before, they're really amazed by it and they really can enjoy it. Yep. Um, so I don't struggle so much with it anymore. I think, I think, because I also feel like it's music that's has a f- certain scale. And I also think Duke's probably an organisation that has a certain scale and yep. maybe wouldn't work if we tried to be, you know, a much bigger, a bigger thing. I don't know. It's hard to know because, uh, as you said before, we've got, Eight members who are all individuals, very different from each other. Yep. It'd be interesting to see. Yeah, I, I don't know how. I can see how we can we could grow in certain ways. Uh, maybe not in so much in size, but in uh, just the sorts of things we do. Maybe and and reaching out. We 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 already do reach out. We do. We, we definitely cities, do, we do reach out. We try mm, to de- mm. to reach out and, mm. and, and and but yeah, sometimes you you sort of like met with with obstructions. You know, you live. We live in 2018, and uh, one of the the lines that music business is defined along is that you have to have what you call bumps on, on seats. seats. Mm. And sometimes you 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 struggle with that, but mm. uh, and, uh, then it is also said that people are uh, you should develop your business. Uh, but I think the entrepreneurship of the of the musicians is tremendous. As in, well, yeah, I, I all think survivors. So. They're all survivors in in a, in a very niche field. 
they all want to do what they want to yeah. do. So they, 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 they conduct their life that they are able yeah. to do it. Yeah. And, and I think there is, an, luckily there are enough uh, people, in, including in funding bodies, who do recognise the value of this music. And we, I mean, we still get funding after all yes. these years, which is yeah. fantastic. And it's really very nice to hear the the, the min, uh, no, state start secretary uh, for for culture uh, yeah. saying actually that that art can be just for art's sake it yeah. doesn't have to have a social purpose or a, and I just think it's so fantastic that someone actually comes out and says that you know that it's, That's, yeah, it's yeah. so I think the climate's I find the climate quite good now actually and and I I'm quite um, encouraged when I see the audience that yeah. we're getting these days too. Yeah. On this positive note, <laughs> and time-wise, I think mm. we should end this conversation. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Welcome back. Voor u staat klaar het Abaars trio. Uh, Ab wou er niet al te veel over zeggen, maar wie weet wat dit betekent, komt een eind.
Goedenavond. De, de stukken die u hoort zijn gebaseerd op uh, de West Side Story van Leonard Bernstein. En een fantastische opname van het uh, Oscar Peterson trio, die ook bewerkingen van die stukken hebben gemaakt. En we gaan nu verder met Somewhere.
Misha, initiator van dit concept. Uh, <applaus> dank. Wilbert Jode Contrabas. Het idee voor dit uh, programma ontstond na het lezen van een interview met pianist Dave Burrell. Uh, die is opgegroeid met de muzici van de 60 jaren, Amerikaanse muzici zoals uh, Albert Taylor, Cecil Taylor, uh, in die categorie. En <coughs> hij vertelde dat hij zo onder de indruk was van de versie van... Oscar Peterson van de West Side Story, omdat het een mooi voorbeeld was van hoe de muziekhistorie steeds maar weer verder gaat. Dat wat Oscar Peterson maakte was een variatie op wat Bernstein ooit bedacht had. En hij noemde dat going in and out the music. Dus dat je een, een klassiek repertoire uh, op een dusdanige manier speelt, dat het verder gaat, dat je je vrijheden permitteert en um, dat vond ik zo'n inspirerend verhaal. Dus vandaar deze leuke avond. Um, het laatste stuk heet um, Something's Coming.
Bima's Radio, Duke Festival, Saturday, 16 June 2018, John Dijkman. What is it? Coimbra. The Coimbra Quim- Project. Tet- project. I don't know. Coimbra. We have no name, so I just wrote something. The Coimbra Project. Yeah. Coimbra is a town in Portugal. You did a festival. We, you we, got invited to a festival. You well, we, a had a, we had a residency there. Yeah, so we had like residency. a week uh, that we could rehearse, you know, during the days, record, and then we had two gigs at the end of it. So, yeah. May I ask, what did you rehearse? What, uh, what, what the, and I know the record, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So how, how did you prepare for it? I went, okay, so I wouldn't say we rehearsed. I would say we played and we recorded. Yeah. But yes. it wasn't that we exercised something. It was more just we were improvising every day and recording everything. Okay. Yeah. So you. So re- that's not rehearsing. Yeah. That's just no, it's, you know. I think I mean, there's lots of misunderstandings about improvisation and rehearsing f- for it. I think while while doing it, you you develop. So sure. in a way, you re- yeah. you you rehearse. Uh, whereas I, I'm afraid lots of people think that improvising is something that happens or right magic or, or when yeah. it goes wrong you have to improvise uh-huh. that's how it's sure. how improvisation is used lots of times in, mm-hmm. even in football uh-huh. if so okay. if a ball comes from a strange angle the uh-huh. player also all of a sudden has to improvise uh-huh. which means it was the ball had to meant was meant to be somewhere else so it was easier to to finish off or something like that okay. and then uh-huh. they used the word improvise there but anyway right yeah, yeah 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 so you were improvising and um yeah well i developing mean that is the nice thing of i mean whatever way you want to think about it the opportunity to be with the same musicians playing together you know for a week or i don't know it was four days or something yeah, but right. to really have a serious amount of time to be able to play take a break eat play again play concerts uh that's yeah kind of rare that's so, kind of rare it's but yeah, it's, a, it it's a warm, warm bath that you yeah like to yeah absolutely enjoy if you have more. that opportunity it's incredible yeah, yeah. and now it's uh, this was last year or uh, yeah, it was like a year ago. A year yeah. ago. Yeah. So like now you're, you're getting, you're getting the, the band together with a few changes, but how's the warm bath feeling at, the, at this moment? I, I take mean, it that you you yeah. work on the same um, the, the same way as you did a year ago. Sure. I mean, yeah, we it's just totally improvised, and we're musicians that I think share a very similar vocabulary. Right. So just in the little sound check, yeah, it definitely felt like a warm bath. It it's felt great. Yeah, yeah. And also, I mean, it's too bad Roger Turner can't be with us, uh-huh. but fantastic to have Mark Sanders. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, wonderful drummer. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the one change is from it's the record just is Mark. that Ro- yes. Roger Turn- Turner is... Um, yeah, he couldn't make this. He couldn't make this. So, yeah. Good for him. He's probably... a Yeah, he's in Canada. Yeah, yeah, he's on tour or something. (laughs) He got other things to do. Um, To prepare for this interview, I I asked you to to send me a list of, well, favorite music and also music that was decisive in in, in how you wanted to develop as a musician. Mm -hmm. You sent me a list with, well, that is... Nicely eclectic from Ornette Coleman, Charles Gale, Albert Ayler, Jimi Hendrix, Faroa Sanders, David Ware, um, but also Stravinsky conducts Stravinsky, which mm. somehow s- s- stood out for me as a that is, and also Billy Holiday mm-hmm. complete Decca recordings, like the old the old ones with yeah, Teddy. Yeah, yeah, Teddy yeah. Uh, was it Teddy Edwards? Was it what? The, the pianist. Teddy. Oh, I mean, the Decca record, I, I think maybe it's a span. A there are quite different uh, groups. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I'm, it's I'm always, sure, always yeah. with the same pianist. I thought it was uh-huh. Teddy. Okay, I yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I, I believe well, I'm, 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 uh, <laughs> I would have to check that again. We have to check that. Yeah. I mean, the thing was where I grew up, there was no live music. So you, you grew up where? In, in, in Wyoming. Of, was that on a farm or in a town, in a it city? A, it was a town of 2,000 people. Uh-huh, and, so small. And the nearest town next to it was an hour drive away. 
and that was 4,000 people. Right. So there was literally no music anywhere near where I was at. So it was recordings, not even like a local brass band that you could join. Or? No, I mean the school had a a band. You know, all uh -huh. in the states, all schools, no matter how small, have a band. So right. that's what I joined, and that's how I started playing. But there was no music happening in the town. I mean, there were a couple of like coal miners that would play guitar. Right. And th that was literally it. Yeah. So wow. every everything I got had to be from like ordering CDs, you know. And uh, this was a time we were just getting the internet then, you know. Uh -huh. And so I was able to research stuff online. Right. And so in that sense, it was kind of equally easy for me listening to Albert Eiler or Charlie Parker or Jimi Hendrix. It was equivalent because... But how did you get the information to... To to where, where did it where, where did it start? Did you did, did you listen to the radio and? Heard? I mean, we only have one radio station. Literally, on our entire dial, we have one radio station that had country music. And then, when I was around 12 or so, it switched to oldies. So no, there was no radio. There was oh, whoa. There was literally no radio. Yeah, uh, I mean one. There was one station. Um, but yeah, when I joined the band. Then I got into playing saxophone, and the closest town, Evanston, which was like an hour drive away, had a Walmart, and the only album they had of a saxophonist was Kenny G. Right. So I started with Kenny G. Right. That and then Candy Dolfer. Record. Candy Dolfer, they also had kind of nearby. So that was one of the first albums I got, wow. Candy Dolfer. Sexuality. Sexuality. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. That, that was one. on there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I joined, I don't know, there was this thing in the States, like a CD club mm -hmm. called BMG, where you, you sign up and every month they send you a CD. Yeah, I yeah, don't know. yeah, yeah. And Reader's Digest of CDs. This, or something exactly, like that. Yeah, this something kind of similar. thing. And from that, I managed to get like a Joshua Redman album. And then it was like, all right, Kenny G, forget that. Now it's Joshua Redman. And then one of the next things I got was Coltrane Stellar Regions. And so, but but you, it sounds like you were chewing on one record. You had to you played them over and over. Oh, and absolutely, over and over and yes, over, yes. That was the only there, information there was, that you could. Yeah, get there on. was nothing else. And, and that is something that's totally different than now. When I got a CD, I would sit and I would listen to it constantly. I would read the liner notes over and over. You know. Right. I mean, actually, I really remember exactly when I made an order to Cadence. Uh, I don't know if you know this company in no. in the States. It was like a mail order thing. They also had a magazine, Cadence Jazz Records. Oh, Cadence, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Cadence. Sorry, yeah, yeah. So I ordered from I them, thought, yeah. and I got Albert Eiler's Spiritual Unity, Charles Gale Repent, and uh, Evo Perelman, Comma de Terra, or something. Right. And... I, I mean, I still remember just taking it out and putting it on and um, just listening to it, my mind being blown, you know, right. when I was, I don't know, 14 But or something. But was, was there a, a, a relation, you were playing in the school band, and the records that you were listening to, was that, was that how no, did that was, somehow relate, or when did it start to relate, and why uh, did, I, do you think it started to relate? I remember summer? once I went to a music camp in the summer uh -huh. when I was maybe 13 or so, and there was a jazz history class. Yes. And uh, the guy, you know, over the course of the week, it went from, you know, Jelly Roll Morton, whatever. And the last day, at one point, he said, all right, I'm going to put something on now. And it's kind of weird. I don't, I don't really get it. It makes right. me a little uncomfortable, but I'm going to play it for you. And that was Lonely Woman. Right. And I heard it, and I was, that, that was it. That it sound. Made, it made somebody in, when was this? When you were 13? Yeah, I was like 13, 14, work. something like that. Is, is that 20 years ago? Or, uh, yeah, I guess so, yeah. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> now we know how old you are. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but when I heard so that, in, in, that in sound. In the early 2000s, somebody is still uncomfortable with, Lonely woman. I mean, I was in Wyoming. I was in like the most conservative place, you know, in the states. Right. Yeah. It, it, and no. also, you, you, I, I think. But it's this something is on a musical music course. That is, also that's musical. What? I think, as well. Like I love living in Europe, but I don't. 
I don't know if you realize how different it is. Like, in a way, the most famous Dutch jazz musicians are like Han Benek, you know? Yeah. Like, you, you guys understand this music. Just the, there's a history here. In the States, there are a lot of places where this is completely far out. Ornette yes, Coleman, yeah. where I was at, was an absolutely extremely crazy music. Yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. No, but even that, that's what surprised me. You, you go to a music course, in a, a summer course, yeah. and then one of the teachers says, well, it's a bit weird, but you should listen to this. And then he plays, I think, yeah, yeah. one of the most uh, uh, easygoing Ornette tunes and, and, says, sure. and still comments that he, he's a bit uncomfortable so, with it. Yeah, that yeah, is, yeah, yeah, of course. So, sort of like... What, Then I'm getting more and more curious. How did how did you get? <coughs> well, the, the thing situation is, I, that you're I was in on now, my you're own. Go, you're about to play, to play with the Coimbra yeah, project yeah, yeah. Or, or at the Duke Festival, which a Duke is a, an organization of like a, a, a getting together of improvising musicians who want to develop the, the right. music to 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 put perspective to it, to to, to put it in time. Mm -hmm. And uh, they all have to show a, a bit of entrepreneurship and and, mm -hmm. and and that's, but you can't get a member of it. You have to sort of like, you know, sure. we just work together basically. That's what we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this sounds very distant from, from you must have come a, a bit of a long way somehow. Well, I mean, the thing was in Wyoming, I was just on my own, so right. it was just me practicing in my basement. Yeah. So it, I could play Charlie Parker, I could play with Albert Isler Records, it was the same. Right. There was no teacher there, there was no one else. And then so I, totally I left quite young. I yeah. left when I was 15 and went to an art school. And then that was a whole other story. Where was this? In uh, Michigan. Michigan. Yeah. So I went to like an arts high school, Right. you know. And yeah, and then it was just full of art. It was the complete opposite. What's the capital of Michigan? Is that Detroit? Yeah, yeah, is it? I, I don't know. I think so. <laughs> I don't. I'm no terrible idea. with that. You're terrible with that. But what, yeah, what town totally did you go to? I mean, I was in Interlochen. There was also a tiny town, but it was oh. a boarding school. I mean, we, yeah, yeah. you know, we were teenagers. We lived at the school. We yeah, had dorms. Right. Yeah. You know, they would lock the building at 10 o'clock at night. You yeah. had to be lights out at 11. And yeah, this kind no of thing. more practicing after 10. You could practice for like one hour after 10. They would lock the doors. Yeah. And But you, you by say 11, it, was, they it would was an show. art school. It was not necessarily a music school, or was it? Oh, well, it was music, dance, theater. But I was in the music part. You, you were know? in the music. So, you, you took a music course. Yeah. So right. my my high school was like five hours of music a day. And a couple of, you know, literature and philosophy right. for the last two years of high school. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was basically like conservatory, I guess. Nice. So completely the opposite of like being in Wyoming. Yeah. Just music so that all was the a time. warm bath as well. So. Oh, yeah. yeah it was yeah, amazing. Yeah. yeah. Good time. It's fantastic. Yeah. And then, you know, after that, I moved to New York and Philadelphia and, yeah, moved around and actually got to hear this music because it wasn't until I really moved to the East Coast that I could hear this stuff live. Right. It was all CDs. You so know. How, how, like, uh, I'm curious to know, like, what's the, uh, I remember, yeah, I bought, when I was younger, I, 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 I bought these records, but I, I was just telling up as well, like, I would, I bought records because I liked the the pictures on the sleeves. Sure, for instance. that of was course, that was yeah. that was decisive. That yeah. was one of the things where for up it was he had heard yeah. radio programs and he was already like when he uh -huh. was a teenager he yeah. was looking for the records that he he wanted sure. to know. Yeah. Uh, He knew what he wanted to buy, and mm -hmm. then and then and then the salesman said like, "Are you sure you want to? Are you you know? Mm -hmm. Yes, I've heard, etc." Right. So it's, that's a, a bit of a different angle for me. It was like mm -hmm. you know, a pure chance. What I, 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 I yeah. happened to hear. The, uh, I mean, I had that a bit too. Like you know, again ordering from this Reader's Digest yeah. thing, whatever. Just but this is a, this a, is a, this a CD a, that had a cool cover. I would order. Yeah, but this is an this is an interesting one. Of you, 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 you've listened to these C CDs. You've mm -hmm. listened to them like through and through. You read mm -hmm. them line and notes as yeah. you said four or five times. For sure. Yeah. Then you go to this boarding school, which is basically mm -hmm. a music school. And then you get yeah. you move to the East Coast, and all of a sudden you have access to go to 
apparently in Michigan they didn't they didn't have these kind of concerts either. No, I mean that was also a tiny town in Michigan, yeah. like far from Detroit. No, there were no concerts. But then, you, you but know. then all of a sudden, like, what is how different is uh, how what does it do to you when you when you is what yeah, was it's, it? It's inter- It's weird. Actually, I don't know. Have you read Proust at all? Yeah. There's this well, one. I think one or two books. There's one section in I don't know if it's the second part, the the second book where he's talking about seeing this opera singer mm-hmm. that he had been reading about. Yes. And he was kind of obsessing about, and he was supposed to be this incredible diva, and it would be this absolutely, like, you know, amazing experience to see her. And the way he describes actually seeing her is really interesting because it's like at first you hear this person and you expect something to be, like, totally earth-shattering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then in the end it's, it's a person. Yes. So you go through this sort of moment of, Oh wait, it is just a person. It's just a voice, right? And you kind of feel a bit let down for a little bit, yeah. And then slowly you start to realize it on its own terms, you know. And there was a bit of something like that. Also, I feel stupid. Like when I was in New York, I saw I saw Cecil Taylor's trio at the Knitting Factory, right? And I think at that time I like I wasn't open to it. I, yeah, I yeah, somehow, yeah, yeah. Uh, like I was this young, snotty kind of thing of, oh, that's what he played on all the recordings. I've heard him do that million. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah, just yeah. had He's this closed himself. mind. Yeah, exactly. Cecil is repeating himself. And it was yeah, like, yeah. fuck, I would love to go back and hear that concert again. Right. Because, yeah, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm sure it was fantastic. Yeah. And do you, do you, do you, uh, um, uh, are you able to translate all these 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 experiences like listening from records that you basically you're you're a self-made man to start with and then you get a, you got polished up a bit at the music school so it seems that you get to hear this good how does it relate to the music that you're making these days as like you know you are yeah you I mean, your, definitely your own voice and uh yeah Yeah, I mean, who knows? Well, who you knows how all that... Play, you know, it's John Dijkman who's, uh, who's playing. Well, yeah. If that, not in the hopefully. first minute, at least <laughs> after five minutes. That, that would be great if that were the case. Yeah, you, I mean, I don't know. You don't know. But that's also something, maybe as well, getting a bit older. At a certain point, you have to kind of stop being too precious with yourself and worrying too much. You know, I, I mean, there were a lot of kids in jazz school, I think, who were really worried about innovating and really wanted to be the next great thing and i think in the jazz world there's a lot of pressure for this kind of like guru thing and after a while you have to let go and just be like i'm a person i'm playing music and hopefully hopefully that's worth something you know what i mean i know what you mean i'm looking forward very (laughs) much to to the concert with a Coimbra project. Yeah, likewise. It's hard playing after you guys. This is a drag. <laughs> you guys at that all. Uh, thank you, anyway. John, for joining us here. Yeah, thank you. Welkom uh, nog steeds op deze leuke avond. Dat concert en die daarvoor was zo mooi. Ja, um, yeah, when we uh, decided on going for this festival, we wanted to focus on what it's about, about the music. And I think that was, that was, these concerts were really doing that. Feels announcements like this almost stupid and entirely besides the point, but we still want to keep up some kind of hospitality. Um, so after we've seen two groups that have been together for a long time, this music goes uh, through the generations and all over the place. And the next group, I think, is a great example of that. And also a great example of improvised music being a thing of the now. Because this group is fresh from all over the place, led by this young hipster, Johnny Poo Dykeman. <laughs> so please give him a warm welcome. Woo!
But similar to your ensemble yesterday, of course, this is not my band. It's a collaborative thing. Here we are. We're going to play. <laughs> I don't have to talk tonight. I don't need to do that. So. <laughs> Thank you. 
seen a lot of men on stage so we've got two ladies at the DJ table because it's about time for that right so uh, DJ Kaya Draxler and Carolyn Moons aka Nutrix damn 